Okay. Check, check, check. Hey, what's up, you guys? Sorry we're getting started a little bit late. Uh, I was having a mic issue, but I'm good now. I just got to use my hand, so here we go. Hey, listen, uh, first off, welcome to week four. Glad you guys are here. Um, I think it's awesome that you guys are coming back and trying to grow uh, in the things of God. I think that's legit. And so I wanted to start with that. Um, next week, uh, the class will change. We'll still have classes next month. So it's a whole new set of classes. We're going to have different teachers. So next month's class, uh, there'll be one in this room and one across the hall. Uh, Pastor Rod's going to be doing one. And it's going to be a study of the book of James. And then Bailey, which is Pastor Rod's daughter, he's, she's going to be doing one uh, called Found in Jesus. And this one's actually aimed towards uh, junior high and high school, is that right? Is that accurate? And young adults. Okay. But if you're an adult, technically you're allowed to come, is what I heard. Okay. But it's going to be aimed at that age demographic. So Pastor Rod and Bailey will be doing next month, uh, and that starts next Wednesday, will be week one of that. So awesome. All right. So we're on week four. Um, everybody that's been part of the journey, I'm going to do a quick recap. Uh, let me start with our, our, our key verse here. You all have to bear with me. Okay. Beloved, I hope that you're prospering in every aspect and in good health, just as your soul is prospering. And so we talked uh, all three weeks about how God tells us in Scripture that our body is a temple and that we're called to host the Holy Spirit inside of us to think of our bodies like uh, mobile temples, basically. Uh, metaphorically speaking, we are what hosts the presence of God, and we take that and we carry that to people in our lives, people that we care about, people that we love, and we share Jesus with them. And a lot of times, we are representation of Christ to people. So that verse is telling us uh, that you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. And, I, and I've talked about this all three weeks. That verse should bring you a sense of uh, a holy conviction, not condemnation. Condemnation leads to death and doesn't produce anything in your life. But a holy conviction is a good thing. And so I, on week one, we talk about the process. And I took you guys through the steps here of really surrendering the identity that you're living underneath right now, which might feel like a good identity, but might actually be bondage that you're living underneath. You might have some strongholds in your life that you need to surrender give up to God and ask God to search you and really go, God, what is in my life that doesn't need to be there? We talked about uh, this identity search and I read, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I, I give you guys the, the correlation of like it's, it's tough sometimes when you're trying to make a change in your life for the better because you, you've attached yourself to some of these old identities. Like, well, you know, that's just how I am, you know? Like, I'm just, I don't have any discipline in my life and I, I'm just this way. And this process is really going like, give that up. That don't have to be true about you. And that's not what God thinks about you. God, in fact, actually says that we were made for discipline. And so I took us through this step number two of going, when you've identified that, you got that new identity from God, and he's told you who you really are and what he's really called you to be. You then can go through this, this next phase of, of beginning to sacrifice something in your life that's in between you and him. That's a good way to think about it. Like, what should I sacrifice? What are you trying to say? Well, it depends. For some people, it's something maybe really easy, like say you smoke and you want to get rid of smoking. Maybe that's the thing. But I'm not even saying that's the thing. What I'm trying to tell you guys is if you will take it to God, he will show you what the thing is. And he will give you a holy conviction about it. And you should really only make the adjustment if you feel the conviction. That's actually my advice to you guys. Because I feel like if you make the adjustment because somebody like me griefed you into doing it, that's a bad reason to do it. And it won't be sustainable. But if God convicts you about it and he gives you the conviction to make the adjustment, he will also give you the strength to be able to make it through that. He knows exactly where you're at right now. And he knows the things in your life that you're carrying that shouldn't be there. So when you take them to him, he will help you. So we talked about uh, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And so 
the reason we're making these sacrifices is because we want to move closer to God and we want to get things in our life that are distracting us or coming in between us and Him. Remember, our job is to host the Holy Spirit inside of us because we're the temple, right? So if there's destructive things in our lives that are messing up that bond between us and God, that bond between us and the Holy Spirit, it needs to go, right? And when the time is right, we'll feel conviction about that. And it will lead us. Oh, I talked about the yoke, remember? I asked you guys, like, what are you yoked to? This is scriptural. And let me go, like, on a fundamental level. Sometimes we can yoke ourselves to fear, and it paralyzes us, and it makes us not able to walk in the call of God for our life, and it makes us scared. And God's going, like, instead of yoking to fear, why don't you yoke to faith instead? And he says, like, if you'll yoke to me, my burden is light and easy. The whatever you're carrying right now that's making you fearful or is holding you in bondage is heavy. So when you say things like, I can't even begin to think about eating right and working out because I can't, half of the reason I'm eating is for emotional reasons. Half of the reason I'm eating is because I'm upset about something and this is the only joy I have in my life is when I eat, right? And so it, there's something more going on to that equation. So Jesus is going, that's true. You probably are yoked to something that's really heavy in your life. And if you will set that down and you will yoke yourself to faith instead, you will walk a lot lighter. When you begin to walk a lot lighter, it will lead you to what he's really created you for, which is the power in your life, the power of discipline. And this is what everybody wants, really. All of us were, were built for this. Though. And in 2 Timothy, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I wrote, a sound mind knows truth, is aware of surroundings, knowledgeable of temptations, and identifies when they are in a bad pattern. That's a sound mind. And that's how God created us. That's what's saying. He didn't create us to be yoked to that fear. He created us to walk in freedom and walk in discipline. Amen? So then I went on to tell you guys about Society, And again, it's not to demonize society. It's to make us open our eyes and see what we're surrounded with. And that's uh, we're being taught on all fronts to consume, to take. Um, if you feel upset, it's because you don't have enough. You need more. And scripturally speaking, we're not that's not really scriptural. Scripture teaches us that it's OK to tell our flesh. No, it's OK to set it to the side sometimes. Will your flesh yell and scream at you when you do that? Probably. Um, but it's okay. And we, I associated that to our food. And I talked to you guys about how it's not really a diet. We're going to edit the way we think about how we eat and how we exercise. And so we talked some about the food system. We talked a little bit about how sometimes the issue isn't necessarily the food we eat. Sometimes as Americans, we just eat too much, period. And how... Even though uh, it's tough because you live in a society that tells you consume more, 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 keep eating. If you don't feel good, you need to go buy more and do more things. And like, like I said, it's not always food. Consumerism is in everything in our life. It could be the stuff that we buy. It could be the fact that we're just sitting there scrolling our phone as a form of consuming, right? So sometimes it's excess. And I, I introduced this idea to you guys um, talking about our livers and how when we, sometimes our liver is an amazing tool that God designed, but we make it so busy and so backed up, it doesn't have a chance to process even the food that we're giving it. And so sometimes by just slowing that down um, and giving it time, uh, it can renew and, and give it a chance to rest. So I talked about this concept of fasting and I brought you guys into some of the biblical teachings on fasting and how like it really is an awesome Thing to study fasting in the Bible. Jesus speaks about three things almost like he knows you're going to do them already. And that's uh, praying, giving, and fasting. So he's not like, uh, this is a good idea. He actually says, when you do these things. So he goes like, when you fast, almost assuming that it's part of your lifestyle. And the funny thing is when you actually do the science on fasting, um, it has amazing benefits in the human body. So it's almost like your creator built you this way. Uh, you could make a fair argument to say that God created our bodies to feast and then to fast, to celebrate food and come around together as a family and eat 
but then also give our bodies and our organs a chance to rest. And they find out through science that when you actually lean into this method, you have all sorts of benefits, not just in the supernatural, but literally in the natural. There's weight loss, digestion issues go away. It helps with your insulin sensitivity, which leads to all types of diabetes. I was watching a thing today where they, America is the only country that talks about dementia and what was it, Alzheimer's, is, and they call it that. Every other country calls it type three diabetes because that's actually what it is. It's when your brain itself begins to be resistant to insulin and no longer accepts the insulin produced by your body. So it causes, your memories are all still there. It's just your brain can't access them anymore. Anyway, this all comes back to the same chart here going like, it's funny how your body for the low price of nothing does all the things that society tries to sell you on. Does that make sense? So your body is actually an amazing piece of science that God created. And if we will just give it a chance to follow the right kind of pattern, um, it will do a lot of these things for us. So there's, I, I talked to you guys about cases of people that had autoimmune diseases. Uh, they started intermittent fasting and their autoimmune disease would just go away. And why is that? It's because they gave their body a chance to slow down enough and go on there and do the repairs that it already had the capability of doing. It just never got the chance because it was so backed up. You see what I'm saying? So benefits to fasting. We talked about food types, uh, these different food groups. I kind of showed you guys an overarching idea of food group one being the best all the way to food group four. So food group one would be foods that are alive. Remember I read you guys the story of Noah coming off the boat and God telling him that anything that's moving is food for you. So from, from the plants to the animals. So I, I kind of told you guys, like, think in your head, something that's been alive is the type of food I should eat. Try to avoid foods that were never alive, that are just dead. And the closer you get to this group four over here, the deader it is and the more synthetic and artificial it is. And I talked to you guys about how overarching, this is a pretty good goal. This is the average American, the percentage of calories we're taking in about 63% of our overarching diet is processed food. So even if just on a, on a small term goal of trying to flip this number would make a big difference in our lives, right? I talked to you guys about obesity numbers back in the, anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so we talked about our foods in the States being like crazy, uh, really good looking foods that they tempt kids with that looks delicious, but it's actually like low key, completely toxic and 100% horrible for your body. Red dye, sugar, it's such an epidemic that they make them ban this stuff in other countries. So in Mexico now, they're not even allowed to decorate the boxes because they're not allowed to make it appealing for kids because it's actually hor horrible for the body. Excessive calories, excessive sodium, excessive sugar. Got to knock your beef Spanish, huh? I, I hit you guys with that one just for comedy purposes. <laughs> a lot of times we're consuming this stuff all day and then we're like, man, I just feel tired all the time. Why do I feel so groggy and tired? It's like, well, play back in your brain the last 24 hours and what you've eaten. It affects you big time. The stuff that you put in manifests big time. So we talked about the macronutrients, the type of foods that we should be trying to stay near. Okay, these are like the food types, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and these are good. And I know this is like a comic book thing, but it at least gives you like a general idea of food that is alive and or has been alive before. And this is the types of foods that we should gravitate towards. These benefit our bodies. Uh, and then last week, we talked about fitness, and I kind of gave you the idea that fitness wasn't just um, working out, it's really, it's really going like God intended our bodies to be active. We, we have active bodies, and if we put our bodies to use, it will respond. But if you don't put it to use, your body will grow. I said this wrong all week, by the way. I kept saying sedimentary, which is like rocks. It's sedentary, okay? Nobody corrected me, by the way. Y'all gotta help me out here. I had to fix it in the video. Sedentary is when you just become lethargic and you don't move and use your joints and your muscles anymore. So a lot of times, it's not that you're uh, uh, not capable. You know, I, I'm 42, almost 43, and I've been playing basketball with these little 18-year-old kids doing full court. And I'm like, man, I'm out of shape. And the truth is, like, I'm really not out of shape. I'm uh, not active enough. And so when I get up and try to play full court basketball, I'm feeling it, you know? Like, I got to take a couple, like, some of these. Oh, yeah, go ahead. 
I'm all time defense. <laughs> because my body's not used to it. And so I'm trying to break that even in my own life and make it more of a pattern of playing with them often. Because a lot of times our muscles and our joints, they get stove up because we're not using them that much. And so your body really will respond to whatever demand you put on it. So if you put no demand on it, then your body begins to tell itself, I guess I don't need these muscles anymore. And it stops keeping them. You don't, you, if you don't eat, what's the saying? You use it or lose it? That's actually factual. Okay, so we talked about the United States back in the 50s. This is what PE looked like. Which if we showed people today, PE would look nothing like this, right? They wouldn't even let you do this. But these kids are all in shape. And I told you guys that statistic of uh, obesity in the 70s was about 12%. Now it's 43%. So it's, there's only now six states in the entire United States that require physical education. It's just not part of lifestyle anymore. Why is that? It's back to that thing I showed you guys earlier. It's like, <clears throat> unfortunately, we live in a society that is based off of consumption and making profit and money. And so they actually benefit from, from this. Anyway, I don't want to wrap the show too far, but it's, it's not advantageous for them to push things like this. But here's the good news. The, the best things about uh, your health and your body are literally free. They only cost you your personal sacrifice, like your time, your effort and your energy. That's it. They don't cost your wallet. They cost you your effort and your time and your energy. Same thing we were talking about with eating healthy. If you don't want to make any sacrifice, then eating healthy is very expensive. That is true. A lot of people go like, I can't eat healthy, bro. It's too, it costs too much. If you want to do it without any sacrifice, you're right. Eating healthy is expensive. But if you will make the proper sacrifices, it's worth your time and you can do it very cheap. It's possible because I, I have done it myself and it's awesome. So active lifestyles, we, I just showed you guys a chart. Like I said, everybody thinks fitness, like I got to go work out. Like I don't think working out's for everybody. I would encourage people to do strength training, but I know it's a big leap. And so I'm actually on team. Any activity is good. Even if all you do is add walking to your lifestyle or doubling the distance that you go. I mean, even getting up and going and getting the mail at, our society is going the other way, though, right? It's going the other way. It's like, not only do we have fast food, we'll now deliver it to you. I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of months they had one that, that would, you could pay a person to walk in and feed it to you while you sat on the couch. <laughs> I know. I remember I said that, okay? And five years from now, I'm like, well, you're right. You could literally pay someone to feed you. Okay. It's going to be like Wally. You ever seen Wally? Okay. All right. So. Here's the good news. Um, your body was really designed to respond to this. And the more active you are, the, the lower risk you are for all sorts of disease, inflammation. It impacts your body big time. So it is wildly beneficial for you to stay active. And if you want to go back all the way to part of the DNA that you guys have it from your grandparents and the grandparents before them, they used to work hard and they had to go out there and earn their food. And if you want to go far, far back, they literally had to go and earn their food. They had to go on hunts and go out and find animals and drag the animal in. And they would eat about one meal a day, usually, as a team, as a group. And they say statistically, 2 to 3 p.m. is the best time to have a feast. Anyway, there's all this science behind it. And then usually that's all they would do. So they would go all day. They'd use their bodies to find this food. They'd drag this heavy food in. They'd sit down together and eat a feast and they would rest again until the next day. And that was the cycle of the human being for many, 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 many years. It wasn't until this 19th century that everything started being available and in high abundance. We no longer have to go and hunt and kill. We no longer have to search for our food. It's everywhere, right? So just be aware of that. The whole point of me telling you all this is to go be aware of these things and, and really lean into... The, the body that God designed for you, which um, is active, which is uh, health conscious and smart about what you eat and, and really lean into everything that you were created to be. So I got to share you guys a little bit of my story. I talked a little bit about um, me getting to train with, with uh, Grandmaster Garza. And I, I talked to you guys about the process I went through, uh, just through the training and being able to, I, I told you guys, like, I went through this process and didn't even realize it. But what I was doing the whole time, I was going through that training. I told you all, he has a real unorthodox way of, of training. He, he, martial arts in its nature is spiritually based. 
but uh, he has a real interesting way of, of pulling some of that. What, what was happening in, when I trained with him is I was getting a new identity, and I began to step in that identity, and I began to sacrifice things, uh, not even on purpose. They just began to sort of not be issues in my life anymore that I didn't even think about. I told you guys I used to drink and smoke all the time, and I... Through that training thing, I just stopped doing that. And it wasn't even like I signed up to do it because I wanted to stop it. It was like a byproduct of walking in that. And so I, I, I was trying to tell you guys about how the Apostle Paul speaks about how we are both and how it's better to walk in the Spirit is what he says. And he's like, these are all the byproducts of the flesh. And when you feed the flesh, all this is going to come out in your life. But the, the, per, the point isn't to say... Memorize this list so you can get really good at not doing it. He goes, the only way to fight this list is to walk in the Spirit. And when you walk in the Spirit, these things will wither away in your life. And so that's what I'm trying to tell you guys. That's what was happening to me when I was trained. I didn't even realize it. I was walking in this new identity. And I was getting some healing in my life. And this purple side of me was growing in strength. And when that side of you grows in strength, this side goes down. Okay? And he's going, these are in contrast with each other. The scriptures say, don't walk in the flesh, walk in the spirit, tell the flesh no. And I, I kind of related some of this to debauchery sometimes, you know, when we feel sad. And I, I joked about the, the serving of donuts for one, and but it's like what I see. Anyway, and, and we sometimes we crunch on some of those things because we feel like uh, we need, but like the flesh takes and the spirit shares. The flesh is always looking to fill like this black hole, and it feels like it has to have more. In society, that consumer thing I put up there is teaching you, like, yes, listen to the flesh, keep feeding it, give it more things. It needs more phone time. It needs more whatever, whatever. But when you start feeding your flesh, I mean, your spirit, your spirit will begin to share, and it will share love. It will share joy. It will share peace. It will share forbearance, which is like meekness. It's like having the ability to do something and not doing it for the sake of others who you care about them. Okay, so that leads me to night number four. And I told you guys we were going to speak on spiritual habits. Because I think uh, in as much as it's important to talk about our bodies and taking care of our temples, I don't actually think you could overcome anything in the flesh without building this up. That's what I believe. And I believe when you read scripture, it's saying that. It's saying you cannot memorize this and get so good at your behavior modification that you stop doing this. You, what's going to happen if you don't build this side of you up? When you get rid of something off this list and you try to carry it through your effort, you're going to eventually fall back into it. The only way to overcome it is to build your spirit so high. And this is scriptural. It says that whenever God increases, I decrease. And that's what that means. So we're going to learn a little bit. And what I did is I came up with, um, I'm trying to do this one a little more off the cuff, so I made up seven things that I think, um, and there's, a, there's articles online that agree with some of this, but seven things I think that if you will add these things to your life and you will intentionally do them, that it will begin to build the spirit man on the inside of you, which is the purple, which I have to give you all some back lore to this. Uh, the reason I did red and purple, the, the guys that wrote the Bible did all types of types and shadows, so why can't I, right? So, in Scripture, the veil in the temple was intentional. Everything in the temple was intentional. And the veil was had cherubim on it, and it represented the holy place in heaven. And the, they made the, tapis, the tapestry was purple, and it faded down to red. And whenever Jesus died on the cross, it said the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. And it was a symbolizing of the spirit realm coming down to the dirt, to the earth, to the dust. And so those two, to me, have always been symbolic for like uh, our spirit and our, our manly body, right? Like our, our dirt bodies. So anyway, that's the, <laughs> that's the idea. All right. So number one, spiritual habits. This one might sound pretty obvious to you guys, but studies God's word. And I got, hold on one second. Okay. So something that builds our spirit man is when we study God's word. A strong Christian is a person of the word of God, constantly studying the Bible. Uh, daily bread is how Jesus describes it. Um, 
If reading every morning, this is something I put in here for you guys. If reading every morning is tough for you guys, which is, uh, I'm not a morning person myself. Doing things in the morning are very tough. My brain barely works. I feel like a zombie till about 10 a.m. And then I'm more of a human. Okay, so uh, what I put on here was as a first step, okay, um, it's good to like just get some sort of daily digestion of the word, uh, like a podcast, a sermon, a worship, worship session, something centered around God's word. But there really is no substitute for reading it yourself. There really isn't. And uh, I know it's like hard to jump into that sometimes to like make that part of your daily life. So if you'll just start with even hearing God's word, that makes a big difference. But I will say there is no substitute for when you read it yourself. That's when God, me, for me personally, that's when God I feel like speaks to me the most. When I sit down and I read the actual text myself. Okay, so... Um, Know the law, live in grace. That's what I wrote. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not go depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Uh, Ephesians, this is Paul, he describes it as the sword of the spirit. And he talks about taking up the armor of God, and he says uh, that you might be able to withstand the evil day. It's funny that he calls it the day evil. I mean, but days straight up feel evil sometimes. I mean, they do. You feel like there's like all kinds of things coming against you. And he's going like, yeah, that's life. Life is painful sometimes. So you need this to be able to stand. And having taken this helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So he's relating God's word to a sword. And if I did a little study on the armor of God. And it's, it's interesting because every single piece of the armor of God is um, defensive. The word of God is the only one that's offensive, the only one that can be used for attacking. And uh, in Hebrews, it's interesting. It calls the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's such a cool verse. Uh, you want to know the answer to something that you're going through in your life? feel like you're confused, you feel like you need answers from God, it says the word of God is able to split down to bone and marrow. And I always try to like relate that to uh, what's a lie and what's, what's true. And God can like give you the discernment to be able to see the difference in the two and split them in, in half and go, that part of it is a lie, that part's true. And how many of you guys know there's always like two sides to every story, right? Sometimes it's easy to reject the whole story. Well, hold on a minute. There might actually be some teaching in that. The Word of God can, can teach you how to split that down to the bone and the marrow, right? So, number two, connected prayer life. And I put these little arrows on the ground because I feel like the reason I use the word connected is because you are tethered to the Holy Spirit all day. And it's the best word I can think of. Tether is like when you tie yourself to something and it's with you. And so, I put these arrows there thinking like, which way should I step? And I know you might not ask that exact question, but I have literally prayed when I'm about to go into a meeting with somebody that's maybe like going to be tough. I pray for discernment that I know which way to go. And whenever you come up to a crossroads with somebody, if you tell them something complicated or difficult, you might have conflict. So you really need the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life to be able to tell you left or right, forward or backward. Amen. So a connected prayer life where you are constantly communing with God. Remember, you're like the temple that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in. You're carrying him with you. And by the way, Scripture says that if you, are, if you accept salvation, then you have access to the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when I'm leaving this earth, I'm going to leave you with something even better. And that is the Spirit of God himself. And it's going to be poured out on all flesh. So anybody that accepts this holy kingdom has access to this. He's something he described even better than himself, which is wild. Okay, so Philippians says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I put on here, as they happen. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So it's back to that yoke thing. You have a situation that you come up to, and uh, it's scary. And you're yoked with fear. And if you have, if, if you will allow God into that situation, even though you still feel the fear, he can fill you with a faith that passes all understanding. A peace 
that passes all understanding. That doesn't make any sense. And you'll have people in your life go, how are you so calm with this? And you have a chance to share with them why. And you can tell them why you're calm and why you have a peace. You can tell them about how you believe. Pretty awesome. Ephesians says, um, pray for, um, this is James, I'm sorry. Pray for and with others. Uh, this is James 5.16. It says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In other words, Scripture is saying, like, prayers matter, and they do, they do something. Uh, Ephesians 6, 8 says, Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. A second. I put on here worship can also connect us, because I feel like some people don't, you know, when you first become a Christian, you don't always know how to pray, especially when somebody asks you to pray out loud or something, you feel maybe a little goofy, you don't know what to say. Um, a good, like, again, a good gateway into prayer and communion with your creator is worship. So I would, like, recommend that to people that are, like, new to praying or maybe new to the faith period. Like, put worship music on. Consider worship a form of communion with your creator. And when you worship, it is a, it's symbolic for you, like, turning your affections to God and, and think of it like burning worship on the altar, like a sense that goes up to heaven and it makes God happy. That's a good way to think of worship. So there's a form of meditation that happens while you're worshiping that can kind of like gateway you into this relationship. But the relationship is the goal. So let me go back to number three here. Number three, seeks godly relationships and friendships. There's a saying that says, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. There's another saying that says, You are the sum total of the five people you hang out with the most. Who's in your squad? Now, listen, this is not a judgy thing. Okay, This is a, this is a question you have to ask yourself on like who you're taking advice from. Because I think there's a difference between being friends with somebody, but then being around the type of people that influence you, right? So they're different types of friends, if that makes any sense? So it's not going like, I'm too good for you, I'm not your friend anymore. Like, no, no, no. It's saying like, who's close to you that you're allowing to speak into your life because it will affect you. And whoever those close friends are have an impact. So Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. So make a habit of intentionally moving towards spiritually positive friendships and social groups. I put on here people who celebrate and encourage your walk with Christ in your life. When you turn to Christ in your life, um, some of your friendships might not make. And I don't mean that like in a judgy way. I'm just going like sometimes you're just on different paths and that's okay. So what I'm saying is it's important that you intentionally put good people in your life that are going to build up that side of you. Because if you try to just step out and do that, let's say your closest five friends are all atheists and they think church is ridiculous and they want nothing to do with it. Like, you're going to have a tough journey ahead. You've got to make an intentional point of putting some people in your life that can build you up and encourage the spiritual side of your life. Amen? And, you, and you'll make it. So your friends matter. So that's another thing that builds up your spirit. Number three, seeks God rela godly relationships. Let's swing to number four here. Uh, that leads to the next one, which is accountable. And I put on here red to purple, because this is a process that we should all enter into, and that is allowing someone in our life that uh, I put on here seeks purity also. Like, this should be an ambition of ours to get more in our spirit, less in our flesh. That is a, a step towards purity. It's us going like, God, I want to honor you with my life. I want to move away from the things that are destroying me and I want to move into the things that are building me up and building me towards you. And so this process of seeking purity comes with accountability. And I put on here, God wants us inside his umbrella of protection and envision. This requires checks. Nobody wants to get checked. They just don't. Nobody wants to get called out. Nobody wants to get checked. But it is an important part of your life. And if you will allow... Like husbands, for example, I say this to the guys all the time. 
the person that probably knows when you're in the flesh the most is your wife. And if she has a supernatural ability to tell you when you're in, on demon time. <laughs> and she will say, hey, listen, you were acting out of pocket right now. You need to go back and spend some time with God because you, you're acting a fool. And she has a good pulse on that. So husbands, I tell the guys at the men's breakfast all the time, like, you should listen to that voice. She's probably right. And she knows you well, and she knows when you're acting in the flesh. She knows when you've been feeding that side. You might want to go spend some time with God and get right, because she can tell the difference in the two. One yields death, the other yields life. And she's the closest one to you, and she can feel it. Okay, so this is what accountability is. It's allowing somebody in your life to go, hey, I love you, but you're out of pocket right now. Hey, I love you, but you were like really mean to those people back there. You probably should apologize. Or at least rethink your steps. Or hey, you're ranting a lot. Have you prayed about it? Because you're going down a dark path of anger. And we all know what Yoda says. James 1.19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You want to build your spirit, learn how to listen and take criticism from the right people. Let me put that caveat on there. From the right people. Get people in your life that love the Lord and want to see you move towards the Lord. And they will know that about you and they will be able to speak into your life in a different way. They will push you towards God. They won't discourage it. They will encourage you moving towards the Lord. So that's the fourth one, accountable. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. A mature Christian seeks a community to help them stay accountable. They choose to stay accountable to the spiritual authority that the Lord has placed in their life. They honor the position. Uh, they also take responsibility for the spiritual condition of others as they grow spiritually. Hebrews 10.24 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. This is where we kind of, uh, this is a church thing. You know, a class like this, for example, where you, there's not always times you're like, you're feeling it, you know, it's easy to be like, eh, it's cold outside and I'm, my bed's really warm right now. I'm not really feeling the whole church thing. And we stir each other, right? And we go like, hey, we both know that we're better people when we go, right? Amen. So I'm going to come pick you up today, right? That's an accountability partner. They help you as you, as you both are journeying up the mountain together. When one of you trips, you stop and you pick the other one up. Right? And then you keep going. So, Galatians 5.13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. This is a good thing for just accountability, period. Don't use the liberty that you gain for the flesh. I. This sounds like a long reach, but sometimes people will will come to church because they need breakthrough and they need God to do something in their life. Like, I really need this job. And then when they get the job, you never see them again. They just vanish. And so I'm not trying to dunk on them. I'm just going, um, there's so much more to your faith walk than just getting, like, treating God like a genie. You know what I'm saying? Where you rub the lamp and you get what you need and, and then you leave. And this is, like, where accountability comes in. You know, you're, you're on this journey with somebody. So you're, you expand your why to not just be about you. Sometimes you come for other people. Sometimes you come because part of your job as a Christian is not only to be poured into, but to pour out. Right? If I could do a whole sermon on that. I'm going to go to the next one. Okay, so this is number five. Multitasking here. I like this one. Develops talents and gifts of others. That guy has binoculars. That's what that's supposed to be. You're on the lookout to be able to recognize gifts and talents in other people. And I know this sounds weird, but this will build your spirit because it's part of your job as a Christian is to identify the good and see the good. Remember how it says earlier, the word of God is like a, a sword that splits truth from lies. You could come in somebody's life and you can go, hey man, I know everybody says that you're, um, you cuss a lot and you're really loud, but that's because really down on the inside, you're actually an encourager. And you, you lift people up. It's just the enemy has taken your gift and twisted it. Right? So what, are, what am I doing? I'm speaking to the truth behind the darkness. And when you use the word of God, you split the veil, reach down on the inside, and you pull the light out of that person. You begin to build them up and, and talk about their gifts that God gave. So 
habit of recognizing the talent and gifts that God put in others. God's gifts are for uh, use in his service. I always say that to people in the church. You want to be fulfilled in church, like find out what your spiritual gift is and begin to operate in that and use that gift in God's house and you will find fulfillment in that. And there's a lot of gifts, by the way. I don't have time to cover them all, but if you want to read them, there are some in Romans. I'll read, I'll read you this part. Uh, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. Or he who teaches in teaching. Or he who exhorts in exhortation. Or he who gives with liberality. Or he who leads with diligence. Or he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So those are just some of the spiritual giftings. Moral of the story, we all have spiritual giftings. And our call as Christians is to use them to edify the body and to lift the body up. Amen? And so part of what will build your spirit is if you will learn some of these giftings and you begin to go around and see these in people. And instead of speaking to what sometimes the enemy will take somebody's gift and twist it for evil, but you, if you're walking with the Lord and you're building your spirit, you'll be able to go around and go, hey, man, I see the truth in this situation. You're actually really good at this. And, uh, and, and you begin to pull that out of them. Amen. We teach them what Proverbs 18, 16 says. It says a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. It's something I tell people all the time. Like if you are walking in the gift that God gave you, uh, he will make room for you wherever you're at. But if you find yourself clawing and fighting, trying to make room for yourself, you're probably not in your gift. And I, I would recommend you to take some time and pray about that and really ask maybe even some of your Christian friends, hey, what gifts do you see in me? What am, I, what am I missing? Maybe I'm missing a spiritual gifting that God's given me, but some of your friends, the ones that you allow to hold you accountable, can speak for that and really point that out in your life. Okay, number six. Go on down the list. Okay, this is a weird one. Let me explain it. I think when you give, it builds your spirit, and I believe this completely, and I could do an entire sermon on this one. And no, I'm not just talking about money here, even though I usually do the offering at church, at big church. Okay, generosity is a privilege. It's something we say here. We are called to give of our time, talents, and treasures. Have you guys heard that before? Okay, Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your bosom. With the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So it's kind of a reaping and sowing teaching. There's all kinds of reaping and sowing teachings in the Bible. Whatever you give is exactly what you're going to reap. So what are you sowing into is a good question. And whenever you give, like I said, I showed you guys that diagram earlier. The flesh takes, the spirit gives. So one of the ways that I personally believe tithing is built into the construct of how God wanted us to function. He's going, if you will tithe, it will put me as the Lord over your finances and it will protect you from greed. Because greed is actually labeled in the Bible as mammon. It is named. And scriptures say you cannot serve both at the same time. So you want freedom from greed? You want me to be over your finances? If you will set aside the tithe, which is a tenth, and you will tie that, I will protect your money. I will protect your finances. I will protect your resources. Okay? And how many of you guys know, I mean, I'm back in my um, rowdy days. I had all kinds of disputes over money. I'd loan somebody money. They'd never pay me back. I'm calling them all the time, threatening to beat them, beat them up because they won't pay me back. And like, I don't like getting caught in that. You know what I'm saying? I'd rather, I'd rather go, you know what? I'm just going to trust God with it. And I, God runs my finances. He knows he's exactly where I'm at. And if I need a door open, if I keep trusting him with that, he's going to open it when he needs to open. I don't need to go out here and try to force it. See what I'm saying? So anyway, God is over all things. All things come from God, through God, and return to God. This is Romans 11. Romans 14, 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, wherever we live or die, we are the Lord's. This is what the guys in the Bible are, are telling us. They're going, everything's God's anyway. We get it in our head that we're like in control. He's going like, these lessons are 2,000 years older than you, bro. You didn't just show up on the scene and figure out money. I've been over money since the beginning of time. I created men that created money. You get too caught up in what's going on right this second. Uh, everything is from God and for God. 
Uh, David knew this when he dedicated the temple in front of Israel. He says, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. He's going, you gave us this anyway. The least we can do is honor you with a little bit. So we're privileged even to have it to begin with because you actually were the one that gave it to us. So we reap what we sow. If we sow sparingly, we will reap sparingly. And if sow bountifully, we will reap bountifully. Like I said, it says in Scripture that don't feel condemned about this. In the New Testament, it says you need to give whatever God is telling you in your heart. God loves a cheerful giver. That's the truth. And if you're doing it because you're grudgingly or somebody guilted you into it, that's a bad reason. Don't do it. Paul says God loves a cheerful giver. That's what makes him happy. Is the heart condition. So I always say it's way less about the amount and way more to do with the faith and the seed that you're planting. The faith and the seed that you're planting is the part that matters, not the amount. God's got plenty of money. Okay, so, and when we sow seeds, it says God will supply and multiply the seed we have sown. So God will increase and multiply the seeds that you sow. And I, I, the reason I put a little dime on here is because for some people, money isn't that big of a deal. I just happen to be one of those people that giving away money for me is way easier than giving away my time. So the whole time, talent, treasure thing is like, I'll give you money way faster than I'll give you my time. So the real thing is going like, if, if you want to build your spirit up, uh, do what the scriptures say and give of all three. So really, is it, a, is, it, is it the same consecration for me to give money as it is my time? No, it's not. It's like double the consecration for me to give my time. You see what I'm saying? So this is really whatever you think is valuable is what that icon is supposed to represent. Don't just think of money. Think of whatever you think is valuable. Okay, last one. Uh, lives kingdom, I put on here. In other words, walks by faith. And I'm going to explain this. You use the kingdom playbook for life's ups and downs. And there's a, there's a parable that Jesus taught on, and I'm going to read it to you. It's called Build on the Rock. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. When the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on the house, and it fell, and it was a great fall. So scripture is saying, like, what are you actually standing on? Like, when you go out into life and you begin to come up against these issues, which is the metaphor for the winds and the rain that beat on the house. You guys ever feel like stuff is coming at you? You feel like you're getting beat? God's going like, that's what life feels like. It's like a house getting beat by waves. That's what your life is going to feel like sometimes. And as you step out into life, if you are founded on the rock, you will be able to take the arrows and you'll, and you'll still be standing. You'll be able to take the abuse that life puts on us sometimes. All the pain, the waves are pain. And you're getting hit by all this pain all the time. But when you're standing on the word of God, you'll be able to stand through the waves. And it will not break you. But if you don't listen to it and you try to figure it out yourself, it's like standing on the sand. And don't be surprised when you feel like the bottom falls out in your life because you are actually building your foundation on sand. And so when those waves do come, which they will, by the way, when those waves come, they were going to knock you down and it's going to be a great fall, is what scriptures say. So build your house on what God says about you, not what people say about you, not what the internet says about you or what you figured out. Build it on what the word of God says about you. When you build on what he says about you, you are building on the rock. That's what that means. Amen? So the seventh one is living kingdom. It's you're choosing to step by faith, not by fear. Okay? That's what that is. We are called to yield to the Holy Spirit in our life. I talked about this earlier. Our, our, Jesus models prayer for us. He says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a gangster thing to pray. And I think a lot of people pray it and don't even really mean it. Do you really mean that? You know what I'm saying? Like, what if God goes, okay, cool. Well, what I'm asking you to do today is to go apologize to that person that, you know, set you off or stole your car. You know that person that stole your car? I want you to go give them the car. 
After the cops get it back, I want you to go give it to them. Right? Like, how about it are you really when you read this? Right? I've had a time before where I, I, I prayed this, and I, I put a lot of work into an old dryer that I had, and I was going to get $400 for this dryer, and I drove all the way to the other side of Seabrook to this guy's house, and then the guy, like, was a wimp and couldn't even carry it up a staircase, so I had to get out of my truck and body this thing up the stairs, and then I connected it for him because he didn't know how to connect it. So I'm like, this guy's pushing me on all fronts here, but hey, I prayed. And I really felt like God go like, okay, now give it to him. No payment, just give it to him. So I'm like. <laughs> so of course, you know, Pastor Steph is in the car. I had already promised her shoes. So she's waiting on me to come back with cash. And I told him, I said, hey man, I know this sounds weird, but I really feel like God wants me to just give this to you. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay. So bless the guy. I left. Got back in the truck, you know, and she's like, all right, you're ready to go shoe shopping. I'm like, well, you see, what happened was. So that is how we are called to live, though. Like living kingdom is going like, God, let, don't let my selfish ambition get in the way of what you want me to do for you today. So what do you want me to do for you today? Give me eyes to be able to see that so that my own selfish ambition doesn't get in front of me. And let me be like a legitimate, willing vessel to be able to step when you ask me to step. And do things that might be way out of pocket that I'm not used to. And be uncomfortable. But I know that you're going to be able to bring that step underneath me as I step. You'll, it'll be there. Remember Indiana Jones where he makes him like step off the side of the thing? No, you are too young. Okay, all the old people that saw Indiana Jones with me. Remember that part where he has to go and walk on the invisible bridge? And he's like, walk by faith, not by sight. And he sticks his leg out like this. Okay. That's the metaphor. Living kingdom calls for sacrifice and trust. Uh, this is the verse I was saying earlier. He must increase, but I must decrease. And that's saying like the more you feel the spirit side of your life up, the more the flesh will decrease. And it's just a cause and effect is what scripture says. God's going like the more you fill and feed this side of you and strengthen the side of you, those things of your flesh will begin to wither and disappear. Do you want glory or do you want God to get glory? Man, that's a hard question to answer right there. And really mean it. I mean really mean it. Whatever you're about to do, ask that question. Whatever it is. I, I ask it to myself sometimes. I'm like, oh, it was me. All right, I need to re repray about this because I was really actually looking for my own, my own edification in this and didn't even realize it. And if I'm honest about it, I wasn't really doing what. Okay, so God, show me then how to give you glory in this situation so that I will do it correctly. And it will yield life, not death. Because a lot of times when it's our glory, it yields death, which is what this thing's saying. Like when you act in the flesh, it yields death. If you act in the spirit, it yields life. Okay, obedience is better than sacrifice. Uh, and I'm going to end with this thought. Whenever King Saul was over Israel, he was the first appointed anointed king of Israel. God was with him and honored him and built him up, gave him victories. Saul and the boys were living good, and Israel was on the up, and they were succeeding. And the prophet Samuel was telling him, like, don't get in front of yourself. God is giving you victories. That is true. But it's because we're honoring him every step we take. If you're not careful, your own ambition and success will cause you to step in front of him and you will no longer be following him. So beware. And Saul, um, Samuel goes, I'll be back in three days. In three days, we will have a sacrifice to celebrate the victory we just won and honor God first before we make the next move. Well, Saul gets impatient while Samuel's gone and decides to have a um, keg party with the boys. And doesn't want to wait. And so he decides to go ahead and go, yeah, I know that priest dude said to do it like this, but like, this is good enough. Let's just go ahead and do this. And so Samuel shows up and says, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm doing the thing you said, like I'm doing all the steps, you know? And he's like, no, obedience is better than sacrifice. You actually dishonored God because you stepped back in front of him. And so the obedience part comes first. And I think we all a lot of times get 
confused because we think like, look at all these things I'm doing for you, God. And he's like, yeah, but you're not actually obeying what I asked you to do. Instead, you're trying to solve walking in the call that I have on your life with all these other things. Yeah, but, but I was really nice here and I did this and I did that. And I, and I went to this class and I, I said whatever to this person. He's like, I know, but, I, but have you actually sat and asked like what he's asking you to obey him? Because that's what the provision is. And that's like walking in faith in your life. And he's going like, the obedience is better than the sacrifice. And it is true. You are making sacrifices and I see them. But to be clear, the obedience is better. So it's us, us going to really be able to walk kingdom in our life. That's part of it going like, God, what is the, the gate that you're asking me to step through today? And I, and I wrote on here, it's kind of a closing thought, that obedience is often the gate to the blessing. And we want blessings in our lives. We want God to show up and give us breakthrough and get through to that person that I'm trying to connect with or whatever it is uh, that we're asking God for. And a lot of times, like obedience, if we're honest, sometimes we're not actually obeying what he asks us to do. Or maybe for some of us, we haven't even asked. We've just done our own version of consecration, our own version, like I said, of sacrifice, which is good. But obedience is better than sacrifice. And so to really walk in kingdom, I just want to emphasize this obedience part because it's the part I think, uh, especially in the Christian world, it's easy to tally up all your sacrifices and feel like you're walking with God and it's good enough. Does that make sense? Well, I've technically done all these things and I think it's really important to just drive this home to you guys to go take it to God really and ask him what he's really asking you to do because the truth is the blessing that you might be seeking is on the other side of that obedience. A lot of times the obedience is the gate to the blessing. Amen? Okay, so those are the seven things that we can use to build our spirit. We are in the pursuit of being uh, well-rounded. I have this last one that I, I read you guys when we started. The, the whole being. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. Not me. Not you. May the God of peace himself be the one to sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Christ Jesus. So God's saying that you're, you're all of them. And, and my prayer is that you let the God of peace himself be the one to sanctify you. And you take this to God and you go, God, what are the things in my life? Like I showed you guys earlier on this process of going, God, give me a new identity. For what you've called me to be and give me the strength to be able to walk in that and when the time is right and you feel the conviction you'll begin to make the sacrifices that god has called you to make and he will give you the strength to do that and it will lead you to what we really are all called to be and that is walking in in power I mean, that's discipline god wants us to walk in power he did not create us to live in fear he created us to have love power and a sound mind amen all right, let me pray, and I'll dismiss. Father God, thank you uh, for a chance, Father, to be able to come. As always, God, we're grateful to be in your house. First off, we're grateful for the people that uh, made a way before us, Father, and planted seeds so that we could have uh, a place like this to be able to come and talk about you, God. So we're grateful. Uh, we're grateful for what your son did, God. The more we learn about um, the overwhelming love and grace extended to us, God, it can only lead us to grace and compassion for other people god we're all your family we're all your sons and daughters father and we're grateful to be able to uh listen to your voice each day god and we're grateful for your holy spirit that you gave to us to be able to walk out this life god and your word that we're able to stand on like a rock so that we can withstand uh the, the waves that, that come in life god we're, we're grateful we pray all this in jesus mighty name amen thank you guys for coming